Hi everyone, this is Reshma here and today I have with me Mrs. Veena Nair. And when I was doing some research about Veena Nair, getting to know her personally and what she does and where she plays her strengths and what her weaknesses are, what I read about her is that she said this and I quote, I mean she, yeah, she said and I quote, my journey in education has been strongly established in the principles of truth kindness and a strong faith in human spirit and that to me was the best thing one person can say when they speak about in the context of education so let me introduce to you Veena Nair. Hello. Hi Veena. Hello. How are you today? I'm really good thank you. Thank, thank you, you for having me. Oh yeah thank you for coming along so let me begin by asking you to introduce yourself to our audience just give us some uh, fun fact about yourself. Fun fact, um, the best fun fact in context of the interview that we are doing, I never wanted to be a teacher. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, wanted, I went to, uh, just like every other student goes through, I went to uh, various career options that I wanted to do, I started um, being, wanted to be a journalist, wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to do some, but it was always something that I wanted to do for people uh, so that was something with empathy and I but I never wanted to be a teacher because both my parents were teachers and, oh. <laughs> and I really did not want to go there. It's like I've heard people say if your parents pursue a certain occupation particularly with doctors and teachers I've heard if they pursue that profession children tend not to pursue that now you're the one who did not fall far from the tree you're just staying close to it very close and i was kicked dragged into it <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh good um so be before we get to the journey of how you are here in australia and how you have received the prime minister's award for excellence uh, last year i want to take you to some years back right Cut to your life in India, um, I've come to know that you worked in an NGO for to support the underprivileged schools, um, deliver STEAM programs there, so tell us about that. Um, so yes, this was very early in my career. Um, I had just finished uh, my graduation, I was not sure what I wanted to do, I, was into, I went into sales and marketing with uh, EPBX systems moved from there into uh, desktop publishing. I started my own business in India in desktop publishing, um, and then I went into um, uh, one of the friends who came and they said, and my father was a big part of all of this. Um, he uh, he asked me whether he, he I would be interested in helping a local school there who was. Um, supporting uh, students from lower uh, SES backgrounds and um, I felt very privileged to be asked to do that and so I started requesting people to donate uh, computer systems or manage somehow to get it cheaper and deploy that in the schools and then start co teaching them coding. So that was my first, it was not an NGO, it was my own organization actually and the NGO part came much later. Right. So the NGO part came after I came to Australia and I went back. Um, that's when my one of my colleagues who was working with that NGO yeah. asked me to come and um, conduct some workshops for principals who were from these low, very low SES schools. So that's, this is like schools in Dharavi and those slums area. So less privileged areas yes, and then you were able to support yeah. them. Yeah, and from there to here, look at, like looking at how how did that migration occur and when you first moved to australia how did you find um avenues to explore and how did you find those opportunities to get into in the field of education so when i came uh, to australia i i was already an established teacher i had been teaching in india um, uh, at that time in heavily involved in curriculum development um, I work for uh, one of the up and coming uh, organizations in um, uh, in web designing and um, something like content providing yep. things like that. And um, when I came here, on a, um, I all 
my that spirit of educator was not all gone uh, there. it was still, still there. active <laughs> not dormant yet <laughs> um i was i came here and i was um uh, pregnant at that time so with my second with my daughter and so i joined the school um where my son was going as um, a parent helper because i really wanted to know how schools in australia work, work. Yeah. and um started developing some uh, stem programs some insights and all of those kind of things um and uh, really uh, getting an understanding of the curriculum so you know i was not actively teaching but i was learning a lot in that space when right. uh, my daughter was still growing up right okay and from there um the most highlights that i've read like recent highlight is receiving the prime minister's award for excellence in the space of teaching and um and we were just chatting about this prior to the shoot like well, how did that happen how did you get yourself nominated for the awards what's the journey behind like what's the real story behind that just yeah um so yeah uh, look um i didn't even imagine someone would think that i was good enough to get nom- to nominate me um i it's been a passion for me to see students um do stem i was lucky that my father was the driving force behind my love for stem um and i really wanted i could not understand why students are not keen or not interested and how i can as a stem teacher myself how i can make a difference and so um i did what i was doing best which was uh, i like learning by doing so yeah. i on the job learning on yeah. the job learning and uh, you know learning basically so um i was involved in a lot of things in at by that time i started a stem program at schools and i had started a stem futures conference uh, for teachers across victoria um of course this is definitely without a team you can't do it and i was very fortunate to get my school view bank college to be able to support me in everything i do good and bad sometimes <laughs> failures happen so yes and um it was a great surprise to me that i was i received a call one for in morning morning from the ceo of women in stem with double m yeah um dr margaret evans galia and um she called me and she said we you know i want to nominate you and i said why <laughs> oh no that's not the first question you asked <laughs> no yeah. so um but she said no you've done a lot of work and we've been following your work and i would like to nominate you and when someone uh, it's someone who's in the stature of dr galia you says that it's an award in itself so you know you you i was so humble and grateful for that and uh, i honestly didn't think i would go to the second stage either <laughs> <laughs> so that was a big surprise when i we got to the second stage and when i got the award call for the award i actually did not pick up the call um oh. <laughs> I, i thought it was a spam call so i did not take the call it was uh, uh the call from the minister at music and i didn't take the call and then his office frantically tried to get in touch with me <laughs> saying can you please call him back <laughs> you've received an award hello <laughs> so he that was very nice so yeah. that that's my journey of this award at least yeah so just for the benefit of um our audience listening to us today um the prime minister's award for excellence in teaching in stem um is is received by individuals who are who do work in the space of stem and that are well known and appreciate appreciated in the society and tends to make and and has made an impact so as a person in the within the stem industry i'm myself a structural engineer working within the stem industry i can understand the volume of impact you would have con- you have contributed have been and would plan to in the future that has enabled you to receive the award so congratulations on that thank you so much and thanks and continue doing such works we all would love to receive the fruits of what you do <laughs> um moving on to your education as a teacher uh 
could you tell us a bit about how your daily life as a teacher is and how you like interacting with the students? So my day um, usually begins um, at around 8.45 when we have, um, very often we have our first morning briefing, not every day, but we do. And then, of course, the classes start. Um, I currently teach um, this year. Um, I'm teaching uh, subjects called Emerging Technologies uh, in Year 10 and Systems Engineering is a great subject. So I invite all your viewers and parents and kids to look that subject up. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, that, these are the three subjects I teach, Year 11 and Year 12. Uh, but I also run, um, uh, or it's not I, it's a whole team now. Um, we run the... Uh, what is what we started called STEM, STEM club or STEAM club. Um, uh, we Just for the benefit, uh, sorry to cut you out there, like would you like to, ex ex I know most people know that STEM is science, technology, math and... Yeah, yeah. So. STEM is S-T-E-M, -E uh, yeah. which is science, technology, engineering and maths. But yeah. I prefer to have the A very much in there. Why is that? Um, that's because art brings in a creativity. It brings in and out of the world thinking. It brings something so uh, unique perspective to everything that we create. So, um, which, um, yes, engineering is important, but um, engineering with that artistic perspective, with that empathy, with that creative it's so important and so it's very I feel that that a has to be there, be there. <laughs> so stem and steam need to coexist is the verdict here um, I, t I definitely agree I feel like um, a lot of people associate engineers to nerds or bookworms or you like book smart and do not associate that category of individuals to having empathy or people being able to understand others or emotionally understand others and bringing that A to it expands, elaborates the definition there so it's it's much more open perspective where Absolutely. You're, you're not just imbi like immersed in books there's much more to it. Yeah and, and what it does is also that um, from a student perspective, students who don't think that they are STEM in, in that STEM ecosystem or STEM subjects or have that uh, opinion about them, so they're not smart enough, which I absolutely hate when students say that, but um, it brings in those students in that space. And um, it also enhances pe uh, people who think that they're very in that STEM, only STEM, and it brings in contact with people who are from the artistic and it develops both these types of students into a much better individuals and STEM professionals or STEAM professionals in itself. Yeah. Um, have you ever felt like you have a very unique perspective in this ecosystem here in Australia? So you've, you've made that change yourself to move from a different country to be here and you bring that diverse perspective to the education system. So has that benefited in the um, education you impart to your um, students at school or has that personally affected you in any particular manner having that different perspective? Oh, definitely. Look, um, we're becoming a global society and a global community and under having this understanding from different points of view is very, very critical. If we don't give that, then we are um, literally shortchanging our students, no matter where they're from. Okay, so uh, I do bring in a lot of like cultural aspect into it. I talk about India all the time and how I was growing up and what <laughs> I learned in maths. And um, I also, uh, when I was doing my master's in maths education, I actually did a research paper on um, uh, how geometry is involved in maths and how the cultural aspects have made geometry such a rich subject in India in terms yeah. of whether we do the Rangoli or the henna designs and mm. everything then our architecture, our temples, uh, you know, everything, even all mosaic things that we have in different cultural, religious contexts that we have, we have inadvertently used geometry without realizing that and that's a 
understanding geometrical sequences is so important because that's where you have this pattern recognition and you know those kind of things so there are so many network points that come out of it so I have I, I did that and I still bring that concepts when I'm teaching maths yeah. when I teach maths yeah. I definitely bring that in that's a very interesting point to say about having that um, association to culture and bringing in Rangoli and henna designs into geometry that's that's a very good mix of art and math there together um, why STEM? Like what drove that passion towards science and technology? Uh, my dad. Right. <laughs> um, my dad uh, was a distinguished uh, physics professor, mm -hmm. a published scientist, yeah. and um, uh, he, was, he was in love with physics. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the best way to put it. Um, so, but his way of getting me involved into that was not as, okay, you come here and you sit here and you read this book or anything like that. It was, um, he would say, hey, I'm, oh, let's see what, how this works, you know. And um, yeah. he, both of us would sit and open these gadgets at home, which brand new gadgets that he would bring. And we would open them up and... Um, look at how he would then say oh this is how it is working or you know things like that and then he would ask me to help to put it back most of the time we wouldn't be able to put it Aww. back properly <laughs> my mother would be upset <laughs> <laughs> but it taught me to have fun and it taught me how to do science and learn science by doing and it also taught me that it's okay to fail I didn't realize these were the lessons being imparted at that uh. time but um, that curiosity was sparked in and then he got me involved in the science talent search competitions and worked with alongside me and helped me develop my own thinking in that space without actually saying hey do this do this do this and you know it was very natural very casual very fun uh, without making a big deal about it and I think um, it's a really I would encourage all parents really um, get your uh, daughters, sons, but more important daughters, to really explore that at home. Yeah. Because that's a safe space. They're not judged by the peers or the teachers or anyone else. It's a safe space and they can have fun with you. And even if something breaks, I mean, hopefully that's it's okay. not. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. I shouldn't be pricey. saying that probably. <laughs> Maybe it's a $5 thing. <laughs> Oh, so do you also use such techniques at your school? Yes, like I do. Teaching unconsciously that they're not knowing that they're actually learning science. You're making it such a fun environment. Yes, because um, when we teach, the subjects that I teach now are all designed. I have I have created those curriculums. So I've designed it in such a way that it's total student agency. Uh, it's very open-ended. Um, they're allowed to fail and um, uh, it's all fun. Yeah. I mean, and then we do analyze. It's not just you do a project. It, we do have that reflection as to feedback loops. Or loops thing, yeah. and have that continuous feedback in terms of having this class discussion. Okay, how did this work? Why didn't it work? So it's not your project or my project. It's a very collaborative suggestion and environment that we have that um, okay, this project, okay, this is what they have done. How could they have, or they ask the questions really. How could we have done better? What do you, what is your feedback? And, you know, it's done in a way that it's not judgmental. Mm. And they are allowed to criticize me. Ah, uh, so. <laughs> what's, the, uh, what's your favorite criticism you've received? Um, probably that um, sometimes I tell I'm going, if I have to do explicit teaching, they say, okay, you need to slow down a little bit, you know. Or this lesson was not really good, Miss. Uh, we didn't do much, and uh, uh, <laughs> but that's fair criticism, yeah. and I learn. Yeah. So it's we are all learning. Yeah. So next time you can plan accordingly. You can if that's yeah. not a lesson that the students are enjoying, you have the ability to yeah. adapt to that and then change it. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. And um, what happens is that every cohort is different. Mm. So you learn from all these students as well and yeah. every personality is different. So yeah. you learn as an educator how to uh, support those students with different needs as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for our, any students watching there, even like parents of students who would like this, their, their girls or boys to get it to STEM, 
what are the available resources out there and what would be one good tip that you share with them to get them to you know start thinking about science and engineering um i would the first thing i tell parents have fun with your students so have have fun with your kids from a very young age and uh this be very aware of this unconscious bias that we have all of us have even now i i have to check myself at times because sometimes it just slips in it's nothing to be you know we all are learning and it's normal we are all grown up with this kind of thing and so sometimes it is quite natural but um being aware of it is important and having discussions with to your children at home as to what they like and what are the different things that are happening in the world from a very young age uh, whether it's chat gpt kind of a thing you know or uh, something else that in any terms revolution that and it, yeah having that uh, conversations at home uh, is very important and i i'm sorry to make it so uh, direct but um it will it it makes a lot of difference if it comes uh, from both parents not just fathers and not just mothers but both parents saying hey look at this, this or this is what's happening yeah anymore. or i'm just i used to sit i don't know whether my son will appreciate me <laughs> pulling him into this but um when he was small um i used to sit with him uh, on we using a lot of lego yeah. i used to play with really? lego for a long time uh huh uh with my daughter i used to make sure that she was helping me um assemble furniture um using tools yeah um when it was with ikea <laughs> or anything else <laughs> yeah. and now she's become far better than me right. in doing that so yeah. getting that fear of tools as well um and so people start thinking oh i can do that mm. enablers like little these are, i can so relate to that like i grew up in a similar family my mom and dad were very similar in the sense that dad used to enable me to do things like these he used to send me like to banks to do things by myself when i was like in my 8th grade i didn't know i was getting finance lessons like or like how to talk to people yes. in a bank environment like i didn't know that was being taught to me at that stage but now that i look back i <laughs> thank my parents for every one of those lessons yeah. they've given me subconsciously has enabled me to be more confident more you know go out there and not fear things i miss them terribly now yeah. but <laughs> um yeah so that's 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 very interesting you say that getting that started at an early age and having exposure to these little things will enable your thinking now the point on unconscious bias right like i've had this discussion multiple times with people unconscious bias in whatever we talk about it still persists Yes. And that is not a bad thing. To me personally, if it's not if it doesn't exist, nobody will be like brave enough to make decisions. Like yes, unconscious bias exists in different scenarios, but if you start thinking about it a little too much, you're like actively forcing yourself to not decide on something. Like I'm fearing that if I speak to someone this way, I'm like oh that's an unconscious bias because I am I've got a beauty bias say for example yeah. somebody looks symmetrical I'm like I'm talking to them and then realizing oh no I'm not talking to another person who looks looks different but that's like inhibiting my decision making ability like I'm not able to decide if I can do it or not because I'm I'm see if unconscious bias is something that is um impacting a wide population base and that has been the cause for people not moving ahead in that in not taking opportunities then that is the bias that we need to check okay i understand where you're coming from that we cannot be politically correct at all times i think that is what you're trying exactly. to yeah <laughs> um i yes you can't and you will at somehow or the offend someone or the other but um empathy is a big part and if you make that um your communications with empathy and um with understanding that it, the right intention is behind it then i think people understand that mm. um but um i'll give you an example of what i mean by unconscious bias so i had a group of students i taken to an event mm-hmm. 
and this person who was giving that workshop was a, a female teacher, mm -hmm. another organization and all of that. She was very pro girls getting into STEM and right. having that experience and all of that. But um, when, and it, it was very interesting for me and it was a great learning moment for me. I had uh, students, both girls and boys there, and the girls immediately went into and stood together mm. and the boys immediately went and uh, and um, every time she was asking a question, her f her bo body was turned towards the boys. Right, okay. So she was not able to notice that the girls were putting their hands up as well. Right. So it, you know, because it was an engineering workshop, she probably even didn't realize that she was automatically okay. only looking at the boys. So that is what I mean by unconscious bias. Yeah. And small things like that make a lot of difference uh, over time. Right. So that is something that we need to be careful. Like m my daughter would say, you didn't say that to my brother. Right. I think we all have said that. <laughs> so something like that is we need to be careful. Addressing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, good, uh, good discussions. Well, thank you for joining today. I really appreciate your time and effort. I'm sure we've left our audience something to think about and some information on yeah, where to start with thinking about science and engineering and arts as well in this space. Yes. Um, so thank you. Before we part off, is there any last few words you'd like to share with the audience? Um, I would only say thank you for giving me this great opportunity. I hope that um, we as educators are able to inspire more students into STEM and with the help of parents. Um, yeah. There's so much resources out there now. Um, every, like, every little thing um, is catered to. Every little interest is catered for. Um, and with internet, everything is within Available, yes. yes. Accessible. Accessible. So, uh, yes, do encourage. And I hope uh, we have many more students coming into STEAM and yeah. STEM and <laughs> enjoying with it. with students, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much.